We have now seen already the Polychama attack in an example. Now this lecture is about how it really looks like in full generality with variables rather than with numbers. So now we have a general n instead of 500,002 and we have a general factorization into primes. So primes and prime powers. So think about the example that we had where the 500,002 was written as 2 times 53 squared times 89. So we're having different primes, 2, 53, and 89. So pi is not the same as pj if we have a different number. And we only take those which have a positive larger than zero exponent. So there is no 3 in the group order. So it's not that a 3 to the 0 appears here. It's only the primes that have exponent larger than zero. And what we're going to do with an attack on the discrete log problem in this subgroup, in this group of order n, is that we turn this into well a bunch of smaller discrete logs. And so for each order pi, we have to solve the exponent ei many discrete logs in the order pi subgroup. And now I'm going to actually account for all the scalar multiplications. So for each of these pi's, I will pay one scalar multiplication to set up the target r, the base r. And then I have to update my target um, ei times. So I need ei plus one scalar multiplication for step i, and then this for all the different primes. And then at the very end, I have to use the Chinese remainder theorem just once to get the, N, uh, the A modulo n. So these discrete logs get me information of A modulo pi and then A modulo per hours of pi, so pi to the ei. And then eventually I can put things together to the whole n. So looking at some examples. So here I've written down four numbers which are about the same size. So 61, 63, 64, and 65. So let me start with 64. So 64 is power of 2, uh, has just one single prime, namely 2, with the exponent 6. And now that tells me that I have to do um, six scalar multiplications. Well, I'm, I'm including the one there, so it's, it's actually just um, 2 times by 32, once by 16, once by 8, once by 4, once by 2, uh, 1. And then there are all the discrete logs and a group of order 2, uh, which means those are triplets. So I'm basically just paying for the scalar multiplication. So 2 times with 32, and then that's it. Still having the 1 state there. Um, then for 61, that's a prime. And so this whole thing tells me, well, I have to do one discrete log in a group of order 61. Well, I knew that before. So there's no effect of Paul Hermann if the group order is prime. There's a huge effect if the group order is a power of 2. And then the other two examples are chosen to be somewhere in the middle. So 53, uh, 65 being 5 times 13. So I, oh, I didn't update this. So this is actually four scalar multiplications. So I have 2 by 13, 2 by 5, and then one discrete log in a group of 5 elements, one in a group of 13 elements. And then another example that is closer to the running example that we did in the last slide set, where we have one of them appearing twice. So 63 has small discrete logs. So we have to do two discrete logs in a group of three elements, one discrete log in a group of seven elements, and then this should have been um, two more sort of five scalar multiplications. So twice by 21, uh, sorry, yeah, twice by 21, once by seven, once by three. Um, okay, so when you look at this, we do notice that the Polyhelman attack means that several groups are much, much weaker than what you can see from the size. So, well, for looking at a baby step giant step or follow draw method, it looks like, well, shoots your n a bit larger, it gets harder. So, if you pick the, say, million three as your prime, then you would have to pay a thousand steps. But what you actually saw is just 31 steps. That's ridiculously much smaller. So, the Polyhelma attack reduces the security of this discrete log to, well, what is the hardest of all of those? The hardest of all of those is the subgroup of prime order. So in this case, well, the 61, in this case, the 13, and in this case, the 7. Everything else was cheaper to do. 
Now, as the example of 64 is showing, it's not the full story. I might also have to do some computation um, because of the exponents. So there's also something which is, well, given the largest exponent, smaller primes, um, so the exponents are the logarithm of n and also the scalable multiplication cost log of n. So there is a bit more, but you have to do something in the log of n anyway, because well, that's how your scalar multiplication costs, that's how your group operation costs. So the dominating factor typically is what comes from the large prime. And in any case, if you're picking parameters for cryptography, you want to pick something which has a large prime. As an attacker, of course, it's fair game. I mean, you, you spot that somebody made a not so wise choice, and then you're rolling out your tools, and Kobe Hermann should certainly be in your toolbox. Um, but as a defender, this is not. This is a thing to keep in mind. You want a big, large prime in your group order. Okay, so now let's get into what are we doing for each prime power. We now know what the costs and what the effects are, how are actually going about. And this is just abstracting from what we had seen in the previous lecture. And we're only looking at one single prime here, only the pi, well, to the ei, and then we have to run this over all the different primes to get the full end. Do this slide many times. And well, it's also just the first of two slides, so there will be a bit more. Okay, so we're starting by taking the full group order and dividing out one of the PIs. Or as I said in the running example, we're skipping one of the primes. We're starting with the point P of order n, so then when we're taking this ni times p, then that has order pi. And then well, I'm calling this ri now. This is going to be, well, just because it's this prime, they all have index i's um, compared to what I had on the, on the running example where I just used the same notation. Okay, so um, here's that si, which is the same ni, but then times q is a multiple of r. So nothing exciting happened here. We saw this was 2, we saw this was 53. And then we solve the discrete log, we're coming up with this ai, and we know that the a the real discrete log, the big one, is common to ai mod pi. So we're doing the cost, well, we're doing a discrete log in size pi subgroup, and we're solving this with what feels appropriate for the size. So, well, <laughs> in the example that pi was 2, it's basically a brute force search, except for we don't even notice that. If your group order is 3, you again would be brute force, 5 probably still. And at some point you get into sufficiently large primes pi, that you want to throw a baby step, giant step, or forward row at it. In general, I prefer forward row because it's, well, storage free, but if storage is not a problem, then the baby step, giant step does give you some constant savings because, um, because your base, this ri, remains the same everywhere within the prime, so if you have higher powers of it, you can reuse the baby steps. So if you have a large prime power of a not overly large prime p so that you can afford to have scrolled of pi as your storage, then maybe so giant step has its purpose and else you would be using port row each time. All right, so then um, if ei, the exponent was just one, we're done. What are we even talking about? We have gotten all the information for that pi we can get. We move on to the next prime. Now, if it's two, and that's the example we've been seeing on the uh, previous uh, in the previous lecture, so we had a 53 squared. Well, we have to do one more step, and in general, we have to do ei minus one more steps. Each of those will be same hardness in the sense of hardness of discrete log problem, not hardness of comprehending it. And for some reason, this is often the most complicated part in the lectures. So I'm trying to go slowly here and really go into details. Done the example. Now doing this. You will get an exercise about it, actually solving the example. So I hope this year we'll all succeed in for the help. Okay, so if E is 2, or each of these steps, E is 2, it comes next. Um, each of those steps, what we're going to do is we're going to remove an extra factor of pi. So we're going to divide our previous ni by pi again. We're keeping the same base point, for now. we're not going to change ri. So we're solving a group again in the subgroup generated by ri. But we need to update our target. 
So our target, well, with this NI, we can't use it, but we have to go and do some updates to it. So we want to have, again, a situation that our SI, given as the new NI, has order P or more precisely, is an element in the group generated by I. But the NI is now a factor of PI divided by it. So this will not actually be in the right group order. This will be something in the group of order PI squared, not PI. Unless, of course, the previous AI was zero. So in that case, if it's not zero, we need to update Q to Q prime. Okay, so that's our Q prime. And then how do we update Q prime? So we want to have something where we can pull out a PI. And we do know from up here that AI is congruent to A mod PI. And so I explained this already with a 53 example, but I'm now going to explain it again with the variables. So we're taking our Q minus the AI that we have just computed. So up here we computed AI times P, and we're subtracting that from Q. So what we have here now, we're replacing Q with A times P, we're subtracting AI, and then we're using that A is congruent to AI mod PI to know that this difference here is actually a multiple of PI. So it's some A, I, uh, it's some a prime times PI. Ha! Huh. So this PI now can go with the NI, and now we are back to something which is a multiple of R. And again, it's not guaranteed to have order PI, it's in the subgroup of order PI. Sorry for the slop notation. Okay, so that's a good chunk of what we're doing. So this was now for two numbers. Um, here is now the general case. So if we have an EI, which is too large, so then we're writing our the, the exponents messed up, so another thing to fix on the slides. Um, so let's write our A as this long thing. We're just doing a base P representation. So we had already gotten the first, we got the A of PI, we've now recovered the next coefficients, and then by just taking the remainders mod p, mod pi, p squared, and so on, we're getting all these coefficients. Remember how you learn to write something in binary, or maybe you learn to some, write something in ternary, and of course you all know what it means to have a base 10 representation, namely a0 times 1, a1 times 10, times 100, times 1000, and so on. That's exactly what is happening here. And so we now take ai, which is a mod this power of pi, so a mod pi to the ei, and write it as this long expression. Each of these coefficients is between 0 and pi minus 1. And then, as we did before, we update, first compute ai0, then ai1, then ai2. Let's assume we have computed a0 and ai1. So if we take those two now and Oh, note, we have to keep the P on this side, because we're now shifting things around. We take those two, which we now know after two steps, and bring them over to the other side. So we now have AI minus the sum here, so minus AI0 plus AI1PI. And then what's left on the other side, this whole chunk, well, it starts with PI squared, PI cubed, PI, so on, till PI to the EI minus 1. So each of those is a multiple of pi squared. And this is how we can iterate. So at each time we update our point by, well, subtracting more, and then we gain an extra power of, of pi. Or in general, if we split at j, so we have computed the first j coefficients here, we move them over to the left side, and then on the right side we have a multiple of pi to the j. Okay, so here are the steps which we're doing for EI, uh, EI time. So we're starting with 0 and we're going up to EI minus 1. So each of those steps, we're updating NI to, by dividing by PI. And we're updating Q by subtracting the new part. So we have already updated it before, so it's now 
So say we had subtracted the AI0, and now we have computed the AI1. So now we're subtracting AI1 PI times the base point P from it. Very, very important, do not forget the multiple to the power of P here. So when you're in the jth step, you do update with the jth power here. And that means, well, at each step, because you're dividing by pi here, and this is divisible by, by one extra power of pi, you again have that you, qi is in this group generated by ri, so si, so the si being ni times this qi, the, this should be a qi, is a multiple of this ri. Okay, so then you're computing the next coefficient. Well, we have computed a j minus 1, so we're now computing a j, uh, a i j, and then we're getting uh, the discrete log. All right, hopefully without typos, here is the full algorithm. Okay, so now this has a loop, and I now have to get indices right, so I'm having r different primes, we're having n as a product, from 1 till r over p i to the e i, and that is the order of p. And we also have a point q, which is a a times p, so that's our discrete log. And you want to get the discrete logarithm of a with the base of p. So that means a modulo n. And then we have this big step 1 here, which is running through all the, prime, uh, all the r different primes. And what we've been looking at is basically the step 1.3. That was the last two slides and the motivations and so on. So we're fixing the prime, and once we fix the prime, we're also fixing the target. So this is the first of the scalar applications. This one we do once for each new prime. And then for each of the exponents, so from 0 till ei minus 1, we have to do a new target and we have to do a new discrete log. Now I want to write this as an algorithm, so I have to kind of add a few things so I can get not notation right. So I'm introducing some artificial ai minus 1 being 0, so I can always compute this update here, which doesn't do anything if j is 0. Um, I'm here doing explicit n divided by pi to the correct power. Um, that is supposed to be a comment, like in Python. Um, so I could just take my old ni divided by pi, but that wouldn't be uh, compatible with this loop because if j is 0, I have already divided by it. So sorry for the extra syntactic stuff. Um, the rest is really like we just discussed it. So this one is always, when we're in step j, well, we have divided by the right power of, of pi. So in step j equals 0, we have divided by it once, j equals 1, we have divided by it two, twice, and so on. We're updating it, which in the first step, because its coefficient is set to 0 here, it doesn't do anything, and otherwise it removes the part that we just computed. So it is removing, like here, the next part, or a larger part. But we're doing this one step at a time, so we have already removed this one, then we have removed this one, we have removed this one. So in the end, we only have to remove the new part that we just computed in the previous round. Okay, so then we have updated the QI. Then we're computing the multiple using this new NI. This one is now multiple of this point RI. So we solve the discrete log. We're getting AIJ. Okay, so this is the inner loop. We run through this EI times. Once we're done with the prime, then we put things together, we're computing ai actually, with the right powers of pi. And now we're getting, after this, we're having this system of congru uh, congruences. So we're having a is congruent to a1, modulo p1 to the ei, uh, e1, congruent to a2, mod p to the e2, etc., all the way to congruent to ar, mod pr to the er. And, well, the Chinese remainder theorem, goes back to what we have up here. These primes are different, so these are co-prime numbers, and so they have product n, so we're getting the full uh, discrete log, so we're getting a mod n. All right, so this is the end of the polyhelmin attack. 
So you should now be able to go ahead and break uh, for any composite group the discrete log a lot faster than if it's a prime order group.